talking about the melograms and I think it was the last. Isn't that the last thing? About how many milligrams mm, per you're serving? Right. Yeah, you're yeah. right. Um, and I have a wonderful suggestion. I'm still hanging out here. Yours was five, right? says for sure. And a total quantity of 50 or 100 or 500, mm -hmm. who knows? It, it, people are still going to, unless you have some kind of reference that says 5 milligrams is going to react this way in this amount of time, I don't know that. You may be right, but I probably wouldn't sit down and eat 10 brownies because I would feel kind of bloated. Maybe that morning should be on the pack. No, <laughs> now it's <Yeah. laughs> Well, I think I'll just, I'll just it off. Do, do we want to require something beyond the package that warns people that about eating more than one or something? That is the yes. Yeah. 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 That's, that's in here. Right the package. Right. And the, yeah. this, the 10 is, is maximum. The board could choose. Your scoop, you guys are setting a ceiling there, so the board could choose to go lower if they wanted to go. Page 38, requirement that the products are labeled with the date the product was manufactured, the date the product is best used by, and the ingredients contained in the product. Um, 
um, and then Nelson, you'll see under, or been in the bill that came over from the Senate um, on line four requirements that they're labeled with information on the length of time <coughs> it typically takes to take effect for both warnings concerning the risks. Um, subdivision E requirements are labeled with a standard symbol, and we saw that. Oh, sorry. Product, does the content cover peanut compound and also? I would consider that, yes, ingredients contained in the product. Um, so, somewhere on the product packaging, it's probably already in here, but I will ask. Information about marijuana can impair concentration, coordination, if you don't operate a vehicle. Uh, there may be health risks associated with exertion. So, so if you look at the talks about that there has to be appropriate warning concerning okay. potential risks, and remember this is just this is what they're developing rules on. Okay. This isn't like the end all be all of everything that is gonna be said. This is just direction to the board. You're to develop rules that have these warnings about the risk, that talk about length of time, you know, educational materials, all of that kind mm. of stuff. So this is just direction to the board. Okay. So again, so you know, as that relates to like the the max, the milli how many milligrams is what you guys have said in here is that you're adopting rules and the rules shall provide for how the limits on these and they can have no more than 100 milligrams per overall product and no more than five. So they can do anything from zero to ten and zero to 100 with regard to the product. Um, Subdivision F, I think I just highlighted that because on some of these, I think people were wondering about the, around what was there for, uh, for testing. And so um, this is just, again, still under the products, <coughs> product manufacturer rule. So procedures and standards for testing, cannabis products for contaminants, potency, and quality assurance and control. I don't think I changed anything of that. I think I was just highlighting it because I think people had raised it before about questioning about whether um, they felt as though that was the language in there. So uh, rules containing for retailers on subdivision four, moving down to um, page 39. And this is elsewhere on other things having to do with the other licensees, but I thought I needed to kind of bring it through is just the for the retailers um, that requirements for opaque child resistant packaging of all cannabis and cannabis products that are sold by retailers. Subdivision so five on testing labs, um, procedures and standards for testing cannabis and cannabis products. Um, so just before I think it had just cannabis um, or contaminants, potency and quality assurance and control. Okay, move on. Um, so the next one on uh, is just. Um, a couple technical on suspension and revocation of licenses. I think actually I would like to, also on the next draft, just on the header there, I think I'm gonna say instead of civil violations, civil penalties, civil violations, and it could just be for me because I'm usually dealing with the criminal law and civil stuff that goes to judicial bureau. This would be an administrative penalty that they could assess. Um, in addition to, you know, just one of the things in their toolbox with regard, you know, so that they don't have to automatically get a suspension or revocation that they could assess civil penalty. So um, just clarifying that the board has the ability to suspend or revoke a license of cannabis establishment for violations um, and that they have the authority to issue civil citations for violations in accordance with rules adopted pursuant to the chapter. So when you think about all the different places where they, uh, you know, all the rules that they have to adopt, everything that they have to comply with is and they can basically set up a violation schedule. So if you, you know, maybe they'll say, you know, one of the important things is making sure that they don't sell to anybody who's underage and that they're carding everybody and getting proper identification. If, you know, they could have a, they'll create a whole system there. So if that happens maybe once, you get, you know, you get assessed, you're in violation, you get a certain civil penalty, it happens twice, you maybe you get a, you know, 10 day suspension and can't sell to the you know, public, whatever it is, and so they'll create that and be able to do the internal enforcement there. 
um, something that's related, and I just wanted to mention that it probably, and tell me if you don't want me to talk about this now, but uh, you had mentioned on the appeals process before what we already talked about that yesterday, about whether or not the, you were concerned whether or not the ability to appeal any decision that somebody felt agreed by the board you know, might be too broad. And so I was trying to think about the things that people might appeal to the board and talk about Dan a little bit about it. And I think we feel like it's okay, the, the language is okay the way it is. And people, it's mostly just going to be because of the board's authority is that they're just going to, people are, will appeal, you know, maybe, you know, a suspension or a revocation or a denial of license or maybe, you know, the assessment of a penalty or once the medical program is under there, somebody who maybe applies to be on the registry would appeal that. But other than that kind of license stuff or somebody's admission onto the registry, we don't really see other issues that might come for okay. appeals. Mm -hmm. And so I just kind of raise it in the context of, of, of this. So we kind of thought about it. We didn't really have much concern about that. Yeah, so but you said you're going to add language here. For just, I'm just going to add, so just in the header, instead of saying civil violations, I'm just going to say um, civil penalties. Okay. Are you going to put language below? Could you just refer to violations except in the second sentence in the video where you say, shall include the full minimum and waiver of penalty amounts. And that's the first time penalty comes Yep. Up. I mean, I maybe it's, um, <coughs> I mean, it is technically a civil, I think you would call it a, a civil violation of the chapter. I just, for me, I was, I was just putting it in the header made it seem to me like it was something that is like a generally applicable to criminal offense that goes to judicial bureau. Right. And so I was just thinking that it'd be better at the header to put Which, should we say and be the board show up authority to issue civil citations and penalties? Because a citation could be a suspension. Um, okay. I, I'm sure. just because the first time penalty comes up is in the sure. second sentence in B. It's like. Sure. Rob. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Can you give me a brief example of what the difference would be between a civil, say, citation and something that would be arguably criminal, where yep. public safety would have some purview? I'm assuming. Right. right. So generally, um, you know, like in, uh, so you have you have your things that are crimes. Uh, they're divided into misdemeanors and felonies. Anything um, that is two years or under is a misdemeanor. Everything over that for a possible term of imprisonment is considered a felony. We don't subdivide. There's a into judicial bureau, that they would be civil violations. So these were things that the legislature decided, we don't want people to do these things, but we don't think that there should be the potential for jail time or a criminal conviction on someone's record. And so um, over the years, that list of things that go to judicial bureau has grown uh, very, very long, and there's all sorts of things in there. And in the context of like marijuana, um, that was when you guys decriminalized possession of an ounce or less in 2013, what you did is you took something that, you know, used to be criminal and could potentially result in jail time and would be on somebody's criminal record, and you guys made it a civil offense where basically an officer could just hand someone a ticket and say, you're in violation of this law, um, the legislature sets a penalty, and then there's a waiver penalty that's usually set by the Judicial Bureau, and then it's just like a speeding ticket. Say like if I'm a retailer and you know you have a, a sting operation right. check where if I fail that that's that's a civil 
issue, I would imagine. Right. Right. But let's just say hypothetically that I'm a retailer and I make a sale outside of the establishment to an underage minor. Mm -hmm. I would imagine that would be more of a criminal. That's going to be, that's going to fall under your criminal law, right? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, question. <laughs> um, okay, no changes to background checks. Licenses. So looking starts on the bottom of page 41, goes to start the uh, new language at the top of page 42. Um, remember, it, it, it used, oh, I'm sorry.
application, you know, licenses. So, you know, in, in thinking about whether, you know, the issue of like if, if all of the applications come in in Chittenden County, right, and, you know, they're going to, and they're not, and they make a decision that they're going to, uh, you know, be determining that they're, they're not going to necessarily just approve all, but they're going right. to have a certain with right. Act. They don't apply to the Cannabis Control Board. Right. Oh, well, yeah. That is true when they suggested that change. Yeah. So, I mean, this is a priorities for Hulu, ACCD, and Ag may work with. Um, but Yes. Right. We need, to, we need to change that so that we are talking separately about the business and technical assistance, but then also talking about the Priority suggestions for the board. Um, I have a question under, well, I think it's under the business and technical assistance here as far as some of the criteria that these folks are going to be uh, evaluated by. Does this all apply to the cultivators as well? As far as like, you know, um, it's like most of the criteria, you know, whether the applicant would foster social justice and equity in the cannabis industry by being a minority or woman-owned business, that, that, that. I mean, are we looking to have all of that criteria apply to every single license? That's on the structure. Um, and again, it's not, um, these aren't uh, requirements in any way. It's more just the factors and that the board's going to weigh. They're going to develop, uh, they have to develop rules on how they're going to utilize this list of priorities. Um, this is including, not limited to. I mean, there, there, there feels like there's some political statements that are being made here. Um, and, and I, I, as somebody who would be, a, if I was an applicant, it'd be a little hard for me to, I think, things, um, you know, whether the project incorporates principles of environmental resiliency or sustainability, including energy efficiency, um, uh, what, what principles am I going to be held to and who's going to make the determination as to whether I'm meeting those or not? The board? No. So when we were meeting with Michael O'Grady yesterday morning, we, he walked through with us mm -hmm. the language around asking sure. the board to, the you know, and stuff like to that. consider whether right. they want to set uh, energy efficiency and environmental standards and what the licensing <laughs> tiers are and activities that would be subject to Act 250 versus, um, right. versus so what might have an agricultural so that will be based on interaction with the appropriate agencies and their advisory? I believe they're going to report back so, to us in January. Okay. But, but something like that, just on the environmental resiliency, sustainability, including energy efficiency. So that's like if somebody is going to, you know, they want to get extra bonus points, I would imagine, in their application to say, I'm, you know, I'm going to utilize outdoor grow during the two months where Vermont has nice weather. Water to water my crops. I'm going to do all, you know, and they can put, they put all that on their 
so, but I, uh, you were correct in that this, I think if you want to get back to the original intent of 903, you have to go back and add some language in there around the board and the development of the rules, not just the, just the, not just the, the technical assistance being tied to the priorities. some extra. 
expectations of that occurring. And usually, for like for us, we don't have any male plants on site because we're only growing female plants. Unless we wanted to produce seeds, then we would grow a male plant. But then you got this male plant in your facility, and you have to be very mindful of where that male plant is, <laughs> uh, what stage of growth he's in. Thing that is later on, but I again on this, 
I and then actually I did Carrie did recommend that that be instead of what's there not be the uh, to read instead the potency of the cannabis represented by the amount of THC and CBD in milligrams total um, so I can you know back to the indica sativa I mean right. it, the industry right now if that's that's the go to terminology and so if, if that's in there I, I think everybody will understand that it's just going to be evolving over time though so so yeah I I understand the suggestion that Carrie made and I and I would support making that change does everybody else understand what what mm -hmm. she just and that's and that's a recommendation of Carrie Jaguar from Agency of Ag but I'm going to leave the strain of variety yes yes strain of variety sounds good here for small cultivators. Um, uh, so most of this is all, was already elsewhere in the bill. This is kind of like just I created the youth section by pulling in and aggregating information in one, lo one location for folks can see it. So this is on small cultivators. So um, it's intent of General Assembly to move as much of the illegal market as possible into the regulated market for purposes of consumer protection and public safety. And also the intent to encourage participation in the regulated market by small local farmers and further shall consider policies to promote small cultivators and then defining small cultivators uh, as a cultivator of not more than 500 square feet. Um, so uh, subsection B, during the initial application period for cultivator licenses, the board shall prioritize licenses for small cultivators. Um, so it doesn't limit them, so it doesn't say that they can't consider you know, uh, applications for additional tiers, but that there should be uh, a focus on getting the small So it raises, I mean, so are the small cultivators going to be held to the same standard as the ones that we just spoke about as far as the packaging? Well, that's an awesome segue into uh, the subsection C. Sorry. Uh, so the uh, board shall consider the different needs and risks of small cultivators when adopting the rules and shall make an exception or accommodation to such rules for cultivators of this size where appropriate. Or just mind melt there. <laughs> And then subsection D, so upon licensing, a small cultivator may sell cannabis to a licensed dispensary at any time for sale to patients and caregivers pursuant to a dispensary license or to the public pursuant to a temporary license, including the time period before retail sales are permitted for licensed retailers. So this is like in thinking about the timeline just generally, but if you have the, the early sales going on by the dispensaries, and then the remember the cultivators are the first ones that get to apply for licenses under the new system. And then there's a priority to license the small cultivators first. So they get out of the gate first. They start growing. The re the new retailers don't come online until later. And so if cultivators are able to have some product and ready to sell that product to someone before either the newly licensed product manufacturers or newly licensed retailers are that are doing the early sales, so that it gives a, a, a window there for cultivators to be, uh, small cultivators to be selling their product before the, the, uh, the full retail market is up and running. Good. Um, on wholesaler license, I also just added process there, again, kind of the idea being that maybe uh, the farmer doesn't want to be processing their own
laboratories, extended it to allow the test, the independent testing labs under the new commercial system to also test for dispensaries or for any, any member of the public who might be growing under 511. that you have. 
just to, in essence, opt in to allow that? The, the current law is very, um, very sparse on that, but I'll show you what it is for the medical. And they could probably talk to you about uh, about how that's, how that's worked for them. Um, so that's all there is right now. Municipality can prohibit the dispensary and then can regulate the time, place, and manner through zoning. So this was part of the original act that allowed dispensaries. So not as you know comprehensive and clear uh, there. So, but this isn't imported into the new language in 54. It's just not.
for procedures for standards for testing cannabis for contaminants and potency for quality assurance and control. So just kind of highlighting that it's in there. Um, it was raised before. Um, um, I have a little question around. I guess it's it's a there the page down. I'm um, sorry, 62. Starting at line seven, um, I'm just curious to know those that represent the dispensaries around the table. Um, does the amount and detail of the information required here would, would that impact the ability to raise funds? Starting on line seven. Yeah.
compliance testing in the commercial market, then they would be responsible for that. So I'll have to chew that up. Um, so just a wordsmithing question. Yep. I mean, I know you're going to change marijuana to cannabis. Yep. Um, but throughout the bill, we refer to cannabis and cannabis products. Yep. No, I'll change all that. The issue is that, um, you know, this language uh, is, is based on from 117, which in which 54 does not exist, and so those are the terms that are used in current law. So okay. I will I will true it all up. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Um, Section 20A was requested by the Department of Health. Uh, just a clarification that food manufacturing establishment or food processor is currently defined um, in Title 18. CBD. 
is uh, this is in one seventeen, um, and uh, and then Representative Harrison made a motion last week to include it in this draft, and I explained the concept to everybody, and folks seemed okay with it. You know what happens is once you guys pass it and then it comes back to me and I have to go through and look at it and approve it before it goes to the governor and then there's that time but in terms of you know the, the effective date on passage is when the governor signs it so that could be May you know or June or whatever so there there you know could be a few weeks in there um, but I would say in terms of we think about the board um, and those things going into effect. It's not that they don't know that, like if it passes, it's not that they don't know that they're going to have to appoint members and that they don't, you know, they're not going to start looking for people until July 1st or something like that. I don't, I don't think that with regard to things like um, but the, those types of things that it makes any difference. 